Sir Edward Lee, it's an honour to serve under your chairship today, and I'm sure we are all saddened by the news that we are learning about Brussels. Um, I'll start by putting on record my thanks to the Right Honourable Member for Priscilla Pembrokeshire for his statement last week and to congratulate him on his new role within government. I would also like to, congr to congratulate the Honourable Member for the Vale of Glamorgan for his promotion and also the, the uh, Member for Aberconry for his promotion as well. And I look forward to working constructively with, with both of them in what I'm sure will be an eventful year ahead of us. I'd also like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the work of many colleagues across this House, and especially the Right Honourable Member for Canon Valley, who I'm delighted to see with us this afternoon, who has campaigned tirelessly for the victims and survivors of child abuse in Wales and beyond. The publication of the Macca Review's report was long overdue. For the survivors of these abhorrent events, it represented hope. Hope that they would see justice, that their accounts of events would be vindicated, that the nagging doubts and conspiracy theories would be either verified or dispelled, and that the whole would be conducted disinterestedly without fear or favour. Unfortunately, the report, which includes more than 600 redactions, adds virtually nothing to our understanding of how the state failed so many children over so many years in North Wales. I will give one. And I'm sure she, like me, has already had uh, survivors contact her to say just how disappointed they were. And this, this was their hope that there was going to be, uh, that there was a recognition. And really, all this report does is leave those questions that were unanswered still unanswered. I would agree. It seems very much to be a matter of, of process and documentation with survivors and victims as really a, a second consideration, which I will return to. The report culminates in a bland list of eight conclusions, which mainly state that Waterhouse was necessary, agree with the instigation of this inquiry, that neither is a substitute for criminal proceedings, and the experience of giving evidence is difficult for survivors. The six recommendations include the platitudes that inquiries should be, and I quote, above reproach, that evidence shouldn't be lost, that there is no purpose in further inquiries, and the hazards of hindsight. I will return to recommendation five later in my speech. McCurr was the third review of its kind after the Gillings panel and the Waterhouse Tribunal, and we will have to wait a further two and a half years before we, we learn of the findings of Goddard's independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. The NSPCC has criticised the timescale especially, saying, despite the drawn-out process, the report reveals barely anything, and they express concern that this might deter victims from coming forward during the ongoing Operation Pallial. I will now turn to the matter of reductions. Namely, of course, this is the removal of names and the details by which people might be identified. On my count, and I may be wrong, although I've counted it twice, there are 633 redactions in this report. And although many of these will be duplications, the Secretary of State and the Minister must appreciate that this is extremely high. The previous Secretary of State for Wales said in his statement last week that reductions have been kept to a minimum. While I accept, and I'm sure many people here would accept, that some redactions must be made, particularly given the ongoing court proceedings and the potential for further actions, I must put it to this House that to claim that redactions have been, made, have been kept to a minimum in this report is frankly disingenuous. I am particularly concerned at the extremely high number of redactions in Chapters 7 and 8 on Freemasonry and establishment figures respectively. Lady Justice McCurr says in her report that she made recommendations to the Secretaries of State on what should be, pub should be redacted in the published report and that, and I quote, it is for the Secretaries of State to determine any further reduction of my report, weighing public interest with the caution. I'll give one. I'm very on securing this important debate. One of the few positives that came out of the Waterhouse was indeed the setting up of the Children's Commissioner for Wales. And does she agree with me in her strong statement that the Commissioner has made that the government must be clear as to why and the methodology of arriving at so many redactions? 
I agree, agree entirely, and I will be referring to what the Ch Children's Commissioner of Wales said uh, anon, and I would hope that the Minister will be in a position to respond to her call as well as the calls that we are making today. The previous Secretary of State also said last week that the rationale behind making these reductions, as set out in the letters to the Secretaries of, Secretaries of State by the Treasury Solicitor and the Director of General Propriety and Ethics, explain the reasons fully. Again, I quote that. But I put it to the Minister that these justifications are weak and bland, and I sympathise, as just been mentioned, with the views expressed by victims and by the Children's Commissioner of Wales, who believes the UK government needs to be more open about the process by which reductions, reductions were made. I ask, first of all, for the Minister to tell the House how many reductions were made in addition to the reductions suggested by Lady McCurr, and secondly, whether he will publish further information about why exactly these additional reductions were made and what the process was in coming to a decision on them. Especially alarming, possibly if not more so, are the numerous and very serious cases of missing or destroyed evidence at several different points during the various inquiries. Lady Justice McCurr's report refers to individuals who have implied in written evidence that they hold information about abusers who were not investigated by the police or the tribunal. She states that following an interview with a redacted name, she made a request for materials said by that person to be relevant to the, to the review and stored by a solicitor. She goes on to say that that solicitor had since left the relevant practice and that the files in question were destroyed. She even says that the person at the firm dealing with Lady McCurr's request recalled prior to the destruction of the files, the solicitor in question had visited the office and, I quote, may have taken any documents he considered worthy of retention. The report states that the solicitor in question had failed to respond to correspondence from Lady McCurr. Does the minister consider this a satisfactory conclusion to this line of inquiry? Is that all one needs to do to get away with a crime? Simply ignore correspondence until the problem goes away. Even ignoring the allegation that the solicitor may have removed evidence, is the Secretary of State or the Minister satisfied that it would be normal standard practice to destroy recently archived data? And unfortunately, this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to missing or destroyed evidence. The greatest cause for concern in relation to the process and documentation, of course, is the fate of the Waterhouse Tribunal's evidence originally handed over to the Welsh Office in 1998. These documents, and it says this in the report, were supposed to be archived securely for 75 years. This did not happen. The evidence received scant respect at the Welsh Office and was then shuffled over to Welsh Government. This is simply a catalogue of data mismanagement, of dependency on technology that becomes dated and, corru dated and corrupted, of the destruction of hardware and tapes, of boxes of evidence and disorder, and a reference index listing 718 boxes, while only 398 boxes were initially made available. It remains unclear how many boxes of evidence were finally handed over to Lady Justice McCurr, but documents were still coming to light on the 1st of December last year. It should be noted that the report was presented on the 10th of December. 2015. This methodology does not instill confidence. The significance of the destroyed computer database cannot be overestimated. This was the record of all documentation. Against this database, if extant, it would have been possible to come to a view whether significant evidence was present or missing. McCure states, and I quote, it is impossible to confidently report that I have seen all the documentation that was before the tribunal. We cannot, therefore, come empirically to an opinion whether material has been lost, removed, or concealed, or not. I'll give way. Um, I would like to make the point that I interviewed six young men some years ago in the Canon Valley. <coughs> I think it's some, sometimes forgotten because it's talked about as the North Wales uh, abuse inquiry. These were boys who were taken to North Wales. And that may be true of other parts of South Wales as well. They, were, they came from all over Wales. And their reports were harrowing, as you can imagine. 
and I think it's an absolute disgrace that there are so many missing documents. I entirely agree with the Honourable Lady. Where have they gone? Who is responsible? And I go back to the Gillings report, mm -hmm. which of course preceded the Waterhouse inquiry, and then you know, lots of the evidence given to the Gillings report has also gone missing. Where is it? Who did it? And what were they hiding? And of course, I, I, I agree, and there is a history, as the Right Honourable Lady mentions, of the loss of evidence associated with child abuse. And I would refer also to the question around the Geoffrey Dickens dossier. And I would ask the Minister to consider whether victims and survivors of abuse in Wales, not just North Wales, of course, in all honesty can be satisfied with the findings of this report. Now that the McCurr review has been published, we are left with the overall lasting impression that documentation and process has been more important than securing justice for the victims and survivors of the abuse that was perpetrated. <clears throat> and that is what should have been the overarching responsibility and purpose of the review. Symptomatic of this concern for documentation and process rather than for the victims and survivors of abuse was the failure to speak to them individually Yes, the review did hold a public session in Wrexham in June 2013. The review's website states that that day, Lady Justice McCurr met privately with anyone who asked to do so, and that the review also met with numerous individuals with relevant information. Having spoken with one of the survivors, however, Keith Gregory, who is also a point of contact for other victims and survivors of abuse, he has informed me that arrangements for interviews were forgotten by the review. Further adding to the undermining of the victims and survivors' abuse are the definitions of unreliable witnesses and multiple hearsay. These unfortunate terms were used at the time by those working within the Wales office to dismiss those who had approached them to demand that attention be focused on investigating abuse that later turned out to be true and to be widespread. They are still in use today. They are very potent terms. It is unfortunate that due to misguided and wild accusations that emanated from multiple investigations into prominent public figures, sympathy, sympathy for the survivors and victims of historic child abuse has swung away from them to sympathy for incorrectly accused individuals. Obviously the cases of figures such as Lord Edwin Bramwell and Harvey Proctor, and this of course is very relevant to news that we've had in recent days, have demonstrated the need to proceed with care and caution when investigations are carried out. However, the danger is that the popular and media perception focuses on sympathy with wronged figures at the expense of genuine vic victims and survivors. The sensationalist and prurient nature of the, of the subject matter makes a good tabloid story. But surely society should make every effort to respect the suffering of all innocents caught up both in perpetration and accusation. Ultimately, after reading the McCurr Review, I am left with the impression that there are still many points that need to be explained and explored under the public gaze. I am particularly concerned about Recommendation 5, which does not read to me in the same way as it was interpreted by the Secretary of State for Wales in his statement last week. The Secretary of State referred to one alleged instance of criminal charges. Lady Justice McCurr's recommendation, to me, seems to be far more wide-reaching. It concerns me that the Secretary of State appears to have been at pains to restrict the scope of Recommendation 5, and I do seek a further explanation of what steps will be taken. The role of the Children's Commissioner for Wales should be strengthened, and she mentioned this in an interview on Sunday. The Commissioner, Sally Holland, as I said, she appeared on the politics show Wales at the weekend, calling for greater powers. She noted the powers the Commissioner has in relation to complaints, adv advocacy and whistleblowing, and that this should be extended to include any area that involves the abuse of children. Might I suggest that the Government examines this point, and perhaps, if appropriate, includes it when it inevitably strengthens the Wales Bill when it revises the changes it needs to make from the initial draft? And will the UK Government work with the Welsh Government to ensure that the Children's Commissioner has the full range of powers that they believe they need to ensure the full and adequate protection of children. Another point raised by the Children's Commissioner when she spoke at the weekend 
was her call for the government to publish or explain the process by which the informa information regarding who identified what number of redactions and which chapter was made. This is an important point. We are aware that an unredacted copy of the review has been forward to the, forwarded to the Goddard Inquiry. But again, that will not report until the end of 2018 and will therefore be another long process for the survivors who have waited for many years already. Victims and survivors need to know what the methodology and process for deciding upon redactions was. The government owes them this. And I note so far that the only politicians to have had sight of the unredacted version all belong to the government. This does not seem right. It is also clear there needs to be a strengthened status of evidence from child abuse inquiries, both regarding its status and its preservation. This is also a wider point for any government inquiry. There undoubtedly needs to be a commitment to ensure children's voices are heard in the criminal justice system and in health and social care, as well as any other sector that involves the care of children and contains the potential for abuse. Rather than simply a platitude that seeks to soothe and reassure public anger and then forgotten as time rolls on. We need to change the way in which children's voices are heard in terms of the process, they, 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 the, the ways of the process adult, uh, in which the process that in concrete and administrative terms, I will of course. Giving way, and I think she's making a very important point about their voice being heard. But in many of these cases, even worse, because they were in a home they were not considered to have that value and, and somehow some people even thought that they, you know, they didn't have any value and that's why they were treated in the way that they were treated and that in some ways is the worst aspect of this whole miserable, dreadful business. I think one of the things that has, has, has saddened me is perceiving how vulnerable these children were, how that made them vulnerable for abuse in the first place, how the abuse in turn has affected them for the rest of their lives and in part condemns them to being unreliable witnesses. And we have not served them well. There is no denying that. I'm very grateful and I congratulate her on the speech oh, she's making. Uh, in terms of process, is she surprised, as I am, at the paucity of reference to the linguistic context of where all this happened in Wales and specifically in North Wales and North West Wales, where the percentage of the children would be well speaking? I can detect very few references to this either in the McCurry report or, in fact, in the Waterhouse which, report, which I read many years ago. And indeed, when we are talking about children's voices, that is one aspect of whether people are able to use their, their first language in which they are most confident and in which they express their emotions uh, most fluently. But finally, now to close, one critical lesson to be learned, I feel, and in this I again echo the Children's Commissioner for Wales, is that reviews from now on in must be centred on the victims and the survivors. They should have the opportunity to advise on both the remit and process of an inquiry and should be properly supported at all stages. These, of course, are the people who live with this experience for the whole of their lives. And it has, of course, been a terrible experience. Dear Khanvarian.